Well, hello, everybody. Um, we are just waiting for people to join in. So um, we'll give them a few minutes. Oh, wow. Lots of people there. <laughs> oh, chat. Oh, Tenerife. Hola. Bonjour. Hello. Kent. Hello. Norfolk. S. Midland. Oh, it's Midlands. Oh, wow. Lithuania. Hello, everybody. Oh, fantastic. Hola, Florencia. Hola. <laughs> Hola, de Amsterdam. Hello. Anyway, this is going to be in English anyway. <laughs> Don't worry. Bristol, Hungary, Peru, Finland, Liverpool. Oh, my God. Russia. Jamaica, Canada. Hola, from Mexico. Yeah. Oxford. Otesa. <laughs> Otesa. Oh, wow. This is brilliant. Taiwan, Slovenia, Copenhagen. Marbella, Portugal, well, from Antina originally, but I lived um, around many of the different countries. So I went, I grew up in Mexico and Costa Rica, Guatemala, and um, my family is from Italy, so and Spain, so I'm kind of uh, <laughs> from all over the place. Newcastle, Robin Hood, oh, hello, Russia, brilliant. Swana, oh, wow, so many people. So, hello, I hope. Um, you are all uh, enjoying this uh, COVID-19 Adapted Language Show 2020. Um, and I hope you had a um, lovely couple of days. Uh, today, is, uh, one, mine is going to be one of the last talks, uh, so we can probably just run uh, over a bit. Um, Toscana, Lincoln, oh, wow. So um, we are going to start um, in a minute. But yeah, uh, so if, um, I wanted just to, to uh, share the, the screen with you because I have a PowerPoint, so just give me a second and I will do that. Okay, um, okay and my technology approach is not uh, the best, as my son always say, so hopefully. So, uh, can you see my presentation and can you see me? Yes, more or less. Yes, it's brilliant. Excellent. Okay, so let's have a look. Brilliant, excellent, excellent. Um, so, hello, my name is Florencia and I'm going to um, be talking about uh, strategies to get your students speaking English lessons. Um, I will speak very fast because I have so many things to say, but hopefully you will understand what I'm saying. And, um, you know, my English um, accent is not brilliant, but hopefully you will uh, understand most of it. So, um, first of all, uh, we have some Zoom features for you to use. Uh, the first one, um, and you probably know this better than me, um, is the hands up feature. So we, we will use that one in a minute to get to know uh, who is there because, you know, I can't get any feedback from faces or anything. Um, the other one is the chat box, which is the, was I, uh, the one I was looking at, but I won't be able to look at, well, uh, at it while I'm doing the, present, the talk. So uh, you can chat between you, but I won't be able to see that. And uh, finally, there is the Q&A uh, button that you can use to post questions to me that nobody else is going to see. So at the end, we will have like hopefully 10 minutes or a few minutes to, for me to look at the questions and answer as many as I can. Um, but yeah, feel free to send questions. And then at the end, I'm going to um, leave you with some uh, email addresses and um, my website. So if you want to contact me, you can do it uh, that way as well. So uh, let's see. Just to get to, to get to know you and who is there. Uh, ooh, 330, okay. So lower on hands. Okay, so if you can use the hands up uh, button, hand you teach Spanish or Portuguese or French or Italian or any other Romance language. And we have, ooh, okay, 114, 150. 16 people, wow. Uh, so hands up if you teach uh, Russian or Polish or uh, any Slavic language. Okay, so that's 25. Uh, hands up if you teach any Germanic languages. Ooh, 40, 50, 55, 58. Okay, 58. Uh, hands up if you teach Chinese or Japanese or Korean or Taiwanese or any other languages from Asia. 
Oh, okay, we have a small group. Yay, hello, 10. Um, so, hands up, you teach Hebrew. Oh, four, yeah, well done. Uh, hands up if you teach uh, classical languages. No. Oh, two, four. Uh, oh, four people, yeah. <laughs> hands up if you teach English. Oh, wow. 74. Hands up if you teach uh, any uh, African languages. Oh, one, two, one. <laughs> and hands up if you teach a language that I haven't mentioned. Oh, so if I'm so sorry if I haven't mentioned the language you teach, but if you do uh, teach a different language, um, it would be nice to, for you to, um, oh, Turkish speak. Yeah. Oh, um, so if you, if you write in, your, in the chat what languages you speak, um, then we can uh, have a look at, at those as well. Oh, perfect. Finish. Hungarian. Oh, brilliant. Oh, thank you very much. It's uh, lovely to be here and thank you for having me. And um, hopefully you'll enjoy the chat and find it useful. So I'm going to um, not uh, look at the chat box anymore <laughs> for, for, the, for the moment because I, I can multitask, but not that much. Yeah. So um, what will we do today? First, uh, we will focus on speech language lessons. Um, we will have a look at some reasons why speaking is challenging. We will discuss some do's and don'ts to get your students speaking. I will share some experiences I've had which might be useful for you. And uh, we will have a look at some of your questions at the end, hopefully, uh, as many as possible. So, why is it difficult to speak in language lessons? Why do so many students offer resistance to this activity with the iron will and stark determination of a toddler who is not going to open their mouths to eat the nutritious food you spend hours preparing, no matter what you do or what threats you invoke? Why? Why resisting an activity so vital to acquire proficiency in the language you want to learn? The fact that some students will sit in silence for the whole lesson and will not open their mouths to speak can be extremely frustrating your language teacher and preparing speaking activities sometimes seems like a daunting fruitless prospect but why is it so hard well to begin with nobody likes making mistakes let alone making them in front of a whole audience of staring classmates and if you speak you're bound to make mistakes no matter how hard you try no matter what level of learning you're at you will make a mistake and me personally I love mistakes. I find mistakes as a great opportunity and I applaud and thank a student who makes one, as I tell them it's the best way to learn something. On the other hand, if in the class there is somebody who is brilliant at the language and has some sort of verbal incontinence, and we all have one of those students, it can be quite challenging for a shy student or one who is not really too sure about whether to use one verb or another, what tense is the right one for what they want to say, or whether reflexives are those verbs you use to talk about daily routine or some sort of meditation exercise you do when you join a yoga class. So, another reason why students find speaking so distressing is that when you speak, you will be mostly talking about personal stuff. Any topic you post to the class, any question you ask, will have a personal answer. Everything is personal. And many people don't like to discuss their personal life with strangers. Whether you're asking a simple question, such as, what's your family like? Or a complex one, such as, what do you think of global warming? You're asking a student to disclose information that will, in one way or another, show who they are and leave them exposed to scrutiny and criticism. It might sound silly or far-fetched, and you might think that I'm exaggerating things a bit, but I'm not. If I were in a language lesson, say a beginner's class, and we started talking about family, and they asked me a simple question, have we got any siblings? That for me would trigger an emotional response because I had two sisters until 2018, but now I have only one. So what do I say? I would definitely find answering that a bit difficult. And everybody has something like that going on in their lives. And you need to be aware that you might be causing distress to a student by asking an innocent question such as that one. So what do we do? Do we get rid of speaking activities once and for all? 
No, we don't. So what we do is we open up first. We expose ourselves, as I just did, to scrutiny and criticism. We teach by example. If you can make yourself vulnerable in front of your class, your students will see that that's okay, that they can do it too. And I know that it sounds like a no-no, like a no, no, no. But let me tell you, I have more than 25 teaching years experience. And I know, I know I look very young, but I, I, I have. <laughs> I have taught students from as young as two years old to as young as 85 years old. I have taught students who went to college and to the poorest South London comprehensive schools. I have taught at Oxford University and at tiny community centers. And I can tell you that after many years of trial and error and of despairing trying to understand why these students wouldn't talk to me, I discovered that they wouldn't speak to me because I wouldn't speak to them. Not really, as simple as that. So what I'm going to try to do in this seminar from a very humble place is giving you some practical advice, strategies that have worked for me and who knows, might work for you too. So, teachers do's and don'ts. My first uh, thing is, you are not Mourinho. And if you know Mourinho, you know what I'm talking about. Don't pretend you know everything and have an answer single question and don't feel threatened or embarrassed if you don't show your students that you don't have all the answers and that that's okay example from the other day one of my students go miss how do you say combine harvester in spanish i heard that word on the telly in taskmaster well i could tell them something or the other but the truth is i haven't the faintest idea what's a combined harvester so I told them that, and I asked whether somebody could Google uh, a combined harvester in Spanish and give me a hand. I know it's scary, <laughs> and it sounds like you will be losing power or authority or respect, but you won't. It will actually show them that you are human and you are not the Encyclopedia Britannica. Obviously, though, you do need to know some things, otherwise you wouldn't be teaching. But in this scenario case that you do know everything, please pretend you don't. Nobody likes a know-it-all. And you know why? Because you can't read them. You can't talk to somebody who knows everything. There is no empathy there. And that is what you need for speaking lessons or for teaching in general, really. It's empathy. When I started my doctorate at Oxford University, yeah, I did. Um, the first thing my supervisor told me was this, and he's, I, I, I really like my supervisor. He is an amazing teacher. He said, first of all, I am just a person. So call me by my first name, because if you think of me as a superior, as someone who has all the answers, we won't be able to have a serious academic discussion and you won't learn anything. And I would be a terrible teacher. And he was absolutely right. So even if I might know most things in my lessons, I always pretend there is something I don't know or can't quite remember. So I ask my students for help. And students love that. It makes them feel more comfortable and it gives them a sense of pride and achievement and a bit of power, which makes them feel great and relaxes them for the activities I want them to do. Many of the things I will say apply, especially if you are teaching secondary school children in this country, uh, including GCSEs and A-levels, but they are uh, not exclusive to that demographic and can extend to both group and one-to-one -one lessons in any year groups. Some of my tips will work better with intermediate or advanced students, and some work better with beginners. But again, think of them as uh, transferable skills. So, number two, you are not Shakespeare. If you're teaching a foreign language to English speakers, as I do, and you are not a native English speaker like me, that is such an amazing weapon for you to use. So use it. Don't feel embarrassed if you have to say something in English and your pronunciation is not perfect. Don't feel self-conscious and get defensive, as many teachers do, because your students will laugh at you. So laugh at yourself first. Make mistakes. Ask for help. If my students ask me, in English, I will never give them a straight answer. I will repeat the questions to them. Yeah, what, what's this in English? So somebody else might know the answer and shout it. But if nobody does, then I try to uh, give them an answer, but pretending I'm really thinking hard about it, doubting how to say it, you know, mm, my pronunciation is not perfect, mm, how you say this, until somebody helps me pronounce it correctly, or as it normally happens, many students do. And that relaxes the whole class and leaves it ready for speaking activities that I want them to do. It's like you have knocked down a wall 
and now they feel more comfortable to speak. You are not a threat to them. I sometimes refer to myself as Manuel from 40 Towers, if you're not that serious, and I go, ¿Qué? And they all laugh at that, and, and it's like everybody goes, Whew. and then we can carry on with the lesson because everybody's feeling more relaxed and, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, funny. So uh, this is the same if you have a small group or teach one-to-one -one lessons. If you want your students to speak, you need them to make feel comfortable and at ease and not threatened. And what I say about English and English speakers applies, of course, to any other countries and languages in which you might be teaching. So, if you are not Mourinho and you are not Shakespeare, then who are you? You are Judy Dench. Yes, you are. Teachers are performers. And every time you teach a lesson, you are, in fact, performing for your students, for your audience. So you need to prepare for it like an actor. If you don't like standing in front of a group of people and be looked at and scrutinized from head to toe and looked at intensely, then you might be in the wrong profession. Uh, I had a teacher once who was a brilliant researcher and writer, but unfortunately, he was a terrible teacher. He wouldn't look at his students once. He wouldn't engage with them at all. He would just come in and speak nonstop for 40 minutes, like me, but this is a different case. And then at the end, uh, look at his desk and ask whether anybody had uh, any questions to ask. <laughs> no, surprise, surprise. Nobody ever asked any questions. So engage with your audience. You need to be flexible and malleable and adapt to your environment like a me. And for that, you really, really need to know your students. And we will go back to that later. But you also need to look at your students, really look at them and smile. I know it sounds stupid, but smiling can take you a very long way. Sorry, and I'm always smiling, it's stupid. I look like stupid, but no, it's a good thing. Smiling is contagious and relaxing. I always smile at my students, and at some point they will just start smiling back at me, maybe because they don't know what to do. <laughs> so people relax and are more likely to answer a question if the person asking the question is smiling. Um, but if you look like you are in agony or about to kill them, you know, they will probably just keep quiet and don't say anything. Um, I say teachers are performers, and the best actors always work with what they have, with who they are, and with what they know. But they adapt to whatever environment they need to be working in. But in the end, you are always you, and showing who you are will make you a really special teacher. So, number four, you are you. Open up and show who you are. If you are doing a speaking activity where you interact with your students and the students have to talk to the class, like the whole class, I mean, not you're not doing a pair activity, uh, it's always good to start with yourself. So talk about you first. Nobody likes talking about their stuff and be the first ones to show weaknesses. Teens especially, they want to be cool. They don't want to be showing that you know they have feelings or any sort of human attributes. So if you are talking about holidays or family or future prospects, anything really, start by speaking about your holidays or your family or your prospects. Obviously, you have to keep it short as you want your students to speak. But when you share something with your class, it will be easier for them to share too. I always use pictures of places or activities um, or things I used to do when I was young or of my family. Um, for instance, when we are working on clothes or physical descriptions or personalities, <laughs> I always bring the most ridiculous pictures I can find of myself and my sisters and friends uh, in the 80s uh, with our crazy clothes and hairstyles. And they have to describe what they see, which is hilarious because we all look you know, absolutely ludicrous. So um, also uh, talk about what you like. Talk about what you used to like or you used to do. Talk about movies, actors, singers, rock bands. You know, I love the Arctic Monkeys. I went to see them. I went to a concert and that's, that's quite a hit with my teenage students. Um, there are so many things that you might like or dislike that will entice your students to talk to. If you're naturally funny, don't be afraid to be funny in your lessons. It's not unprofessional or inappropriate. My aim has always been to help my students do the best they can. And if I can do that by being funny and making them laugh, then why not? You know, if you're good at making jokes, great, use it. That will relax your, relax your audience you know, slash students and make them speak. Because you need to create a relaxed environment for that. Um, I always talk about my family and friends, <laughs> and probably they hate me for it, and my 19-year-old uh, son particularly, um, with my students. And um, 
and and it creates like a you know it's it's a way of empathizing with your student it's a way of creating a bond but if you don't want to talk about your family or friends because you don't lecture in that stuff and you don't feel comfortable doing it why not create an imaginary friend or friends that you can use as a starter for your speaking activities you know but to be able to do this and to be able to relate to your students to empathize and to make them speak you really need to know them no shortcut for that so number five know your audience take the time to know your students find out what they like and what they are interested in in your first lesson and do some research and then use the topics they are interested in to model your lessons Organize your speaking activities around topics you know your students will be familiar with, namely their everyday life and interests, their problems, their frustration. I know it will take, you know, no, probably more time initially, but it will be definitely worth it. Uh, you can make an anonymous survey on your first lesson with questions on music, cinema, books, school, work, sports, TV, how they keep fit, how they keep informed, pastimes, anything that might help you. Collect that survey at the end of the lesson, and this will give you clues on what aspects within a topic would be appealing to your students. Uh, what pictures you can use to, to spark interest on that topic and draw your students to speak. I um, love teaching. I do love teaching uh, because it has allowed me to meet some amazing people from many, many very different backgrounds and ages. And I have learned so much about so many different things on the process. But every student is different. I cater for all audiences. So you need to do your homework too. I have had to find about such a variety of topics all over the years. And recently, you, know, you name it, Korean group BTS, with which all the girls were in love uh, last year for some reason, Avengers, Xbox, Call of Duty, football, gardening, the royal family, cars, antique shows, Aussie gold hunters, soap operas, strictly come dancing, electronic music, surf, Manuel Lil Miranda and London musicals, the British Bake Off, Pretty Little Things, Strange Things, Knots and Crosses, you name it. But knowing about the things your students like will help you communicate better with them and will make it easier for them to speak. And by saying know your audience, I just don't mean, you know, find something about them. If you have to work on descriptions and personalities, for instance, have a little research about what celebrities or characters or politicians your students are all about. And that I'm afraid, you know, we change every few months. Uh, but get some pictures for of these people uh, to use for descriptions and comparisons. Get some cartoon characters if you're teaching children. Get some Harry Styles or Jonas Brothers or Love Islands photos for your teens or some of uh, delightful Trump or Boris or Angela Merkel for your adults or whoever they are interested in as per your initial research. Sorry, the, the, the delightful Trump was ironic. Um, find interesting characters or pictures or topics, uh, but here's the key. Not things that you find interesting, but those that your students would be interested in, even if you are not. So don't try to find characters that you think would be interesting. Try to find what they find interesting. Otherwise, they, don't be, they won't be you know, attracted to them. Teenagers can be particularly challenging. Um, believe me, believe you me, <laughs> teenagers are not monsters. I know, I know it's hard to believe, but they are almost human. And I love teaching teenagers. They are great fun, have so many brilliant ideas and refreshing and exciting views on every aspect of life. They are extremely passionate about certain issues and do everything with intensity, as if life on earth was about to end. But I agree, they are sometimes extremely difficult to engage, particularly if they are not interested. So make them interested. How do you do that? Don't be a boomer. For them, we teachers and adults in general are now able as belonging either to Generation X, the me, or worse, to the boomer generation. And you need to prove them wrong. You are not a boomer. I spend so much time trying to keep up with what's going on in the world because it's ever changing. Having a teenage son helps, but most of the time it's my own students who keep me updated. And this week, for instance, I found out that the test that you have to do is called 16 personalities. And they went, oh my God, you haven't heard about it. You have to do it. So I had to do it or they, would leave and they wouldn't leave me in peace. So I did the test, it's actually quite fun. <laughs> but there is an endless brilliant source of material for your lessons in listening to what they listen to. 
whether it be Playboy Carti or Tekashi 69, what they watch, you know, whether it be Marvel or DC or Love Island or the TikTok videos or completely waste of time box opening videos or the Polish dancing cow now on YouTube. But I know that the time I invest doing this is not wasted uh, because at the end of the day, I know that if I say to the class, okay, today we will be talking about music and our favorite singers or bands. You know? And I go first and say, me, for instance, I love Playboy Carti, but I'm so upset he hasn't released his new album in, you know, in lockdown as he promised. We are all waiting. There will be an uproar. They will start laughing in utter disbelief and start talking immediately. Uh, with GCSE and A-level students in many courses, you also have to discuss the topic of the environment. And many young people are very passionate about this. Many of them are vegetarian or vegan as a conscious decision to help everyone. So this is another great opportunity for you to inside, inside conversation. <laughs> uh, the recent fires all over uh, the Amazon, some of which have to do with the need of, um, to, you know, to create land for agriculture or, or cattle, and the emergence of COVID-19 can be used to spark a discussion on whether we are doing the right thing or humans are a pest to the earth. Uh, in the latest uh, Mar Marvel movie, which I'm sure everybody uh, knows about, Endgame, Thanos was trying to eliminate half of the world population to help Earth recover. So sometimes I use that in class to ask whether they think he's a villain or not, and whether they think he was right, or whether they think COVID-19 is a way in which the Earth is fighting back, or is it our fault for tampering with things we shouldn't be tampering with, uh, like other animal diseases we've had before, such as the mad cow disease or chicken flu that can affect humans. Try to find a way to work on these kind of topics that will attract students and make them have something to say. Because if they have something to say about it, they will speak. They will. So if you um, use, you know, just what's on the book and the speaking tasks they will have there, they will most likely find them boring and won't speak as much. You know, some of those tasks are, are pretty boring. Um, they will also find it more difficult to remember the vocabulary because learning vocab is boring. <laughs> but if they need to speak and make a point, they probably will make an effort trying to learn the vocabulary that will help them you know, explain what they mean. For example, you could divide the class and say, okay, you lot are Thanos and friends, and you lot are the Avengers, and you have to convince the other that they are on the wrong regarding their view on how to revert climate change. Yeah, so you can have like a Marvel stand about climate change. So what would the Avengers solutions to this be? Be if not, you know, get rid of humans. Uh, what can humans do to prove they are worth staying and worth saving? You need to be uh, daring and a bit confrontational. Sometimes, when we are working on the same topic, uh, the environment, I would say, okay, today we're going to be talking about the environment. But I, you know, I never understand what the problem is with global warming. I mean, what's not to like? You know, summers are warmer, it's sunnier, we can go to the seaside for longer. It's quite clear I'm being ironic, but they can see it's going, oh my God, and start talking about what's wrong with global warming, you know, just to shut me up. You can talk about immigration and racism and use famous quotes by you know, various worldwide personalities. You can give a quote to each student and ask them to try to understand what it means and explain it to the others. Or better still, ask them to find a quote they like or find meaningful about the topic, or, or you can use this with any topic really, and explain it to, the follow, uh, to, to, you know, to their mates, um, to their classmates, sorry, uh, the following lessons. Uh, one thing I also used to talk about immigration and racism is comic strips from newspapers, and we we will discuss them in class because they are quite you know, they are quite a fun thing to do as well. Or I have a selection of quotes in favor and uh, against immigration, and these are real quotes that I have taken from TV, from the news, things I've heard on the street, things I've heard from from politicians, and they have to take one from a bag and read it and say whether they agree with it or not and why. Some of the quotes are really outrageous, but they are all real, and they like that, the opportunity to argue against something that they see as wrong. Oops. So, have you ever felt discriminated? And I can't see your chat box, so I, I can't see whether you're raising your hands or not, but I, I think you have. I have, and not because of the color of my skin, but because of the way I speak English, and on many, many occasions. I have also been discriminated because I am a woman. 
and I will tell them about any of the times this happened to me. This happens, uh, you know, quite often, <laughs> and ask them what they think and whether they have suffered the same. Because if students feel identified and feel empathy, they will want to speak. When we talk about gender inequality and women's rights or the advance of women's rights, I always make a little bit, which is a bit confrontational as well. Because courses focus too much on pay gaps and women at work, which has changed as much better. So it looks like we are all doing great, pat on our backs, well done. So I ask boys and girls, if you were coming back from a party at 2 a.m., would you walk home alone? If you're walking home alone at 2 a.m., are you scared? If you're walking alone at 2 a.m., are you worried about what you're wearing? Are the answers always su surprise them and, and spark discussion? Because that is a difference that no equal access to education or work promotions is going to solve. It's a difference that runs deep. And then I use that about all the current protests all, all, all over the world on gender violence and how they think we should tackle this problem. This is a topic that might cause distress, of course, to some of your students. So you need to be aware of this and prepare accordingly. You might want to find out um, you know, about your students' backgrounds or talk to the school nurse, nurse or, or to the head uh, to assess how you approach this and you know, to know whether some of your students would struggle with this topic. But, but it's worth talking about because it's a topic that is you know, it's, it's current and it's very important and it's in the news and there are so many movements all around the place. And this is the kind of, you know, these are the kind of things that they are interested about. But having said all that, all in all, have fun. Make your speaking activities interesting and fun, both for your students and for yourself. Work on the topics in a way that challenges students and spark interest. Some people don't like talking about themselves, so if you find that there is a barrier there, you can create speaking activities asking them to use a persona instead. Ask them to speak as if they were somebody else. You can have, for instance, a bag with celebrities' names, politicians, actors, singers, sport people, designers, chefs, big variety and they need to pick one and speak from their perspective so to make it easier you can create a card for each celebrity with a picture details of family where they live hobbies professions etc so that they can use that when speaking so they won't have to think about it and they will speak faster you know or do it quicker or you can ask them to create a card so if you don't have time you know use your students to do the work uh, ask them to create a card for a person they admire and use their perspectives to speak uh, with more advanced students you can have cards with people with opposing views like i don't know donald trump and greta thunberg and each pair needs to have a discussion on a topic from that person's perspective you can also organize your speaking activity giving them instructions such as uh, okay you are speaking from this perspective you are the nicest person ever you are the meanest person ever. You're a highly important business person. You are a five-year-old child. You're the prime minister. You're a football coach. And you can adapt the types to whatever work better for the topic you want to practice. And that's a good idea because they, they won't have to put themselves on the line. I mean, it's not me speaking. It's you know, Donald Trump or the prime minister or a five-year-old child. Also, it's a good idea to use lots of pictures in speaking activities. Uh, I have a selection of images of weird and amazing places that I use to talk about holidays or description of places or to talk about houses. Uh, and I adapt the type of activity and the difficulty of the task, the difficulty, sorry, of the task for each level. For instance, I have these images, which are lovely. <laughs> you can use them to make them speak saying, you know, okay, you went on holidays to one of these places. How was it? What did you do there? How, how well you know describe the hotel? Where did you sleep? Or this is your hometown. What like? What is it like? You know what can you do there? Or this is your house. Describe it. Oh, and by the way, uh, they they love either the haunted house or the frozen castle. To sp they, they they always choose that one. That's my house. Um, for description, uh, I love using pictures like this, especially the handsome uh, man on the right corner. Um, you need to use pictures that are quirky or funny or different. And you can also use them to talk about, you know, now and before. So what was handsome now? What is handsome now? What was handsome before? Or what do you, you know, what do you wear now and what people used to wear before? Uh, or activities, what they used to do now, uh, before, what do they do now? So it's, you know, the, you can use them for anything. Uh, but of, of course, one thing is creating a speaking activities about family or, you know, 
handsome boys or hobbies or favorite movies. And another is creating activities, speaking activities to practice grammar, you know, a grammar topic that you need to tackle, especially if the grammar topic is boring or difficult. But again, use your creativity. For instance, to practice the imperative with teenagers, uh, you know, kind of an A2 uh, level, you can have a role play in pairs. One is the father or mother and one is the child and the parents need to tell the child what to do. So ask them, imagine you are your parent. What do they always tell you to do? Clean your room, hoover the house, take rubbish out, stop watching you know, your phone um, or stop playing with the Xbox. It's great to practice vocabulary for chores. So if you have GCSE students, this is um, one of the topics that they have for the exam. And teenagers love talking about all the horrendous things parents ask them to do instead of letting them sit all day and play in Xbox or going on Instagram. To practice the subjunctive with more advanced groups, same thing but a bit more complex. So what do your parents want you to do? And you go, my mom wants me to, my dad wants me to, uh, and then the opposite. What do you want your parents to do instead? If you have adult groups, you can do the reverse thing. So what do you want your children to do? Or what do you tell your children to do? But if they don't have children, because you, you know, not everybody has children. So what happens if they have children? Well, you can use it to adapt to whatever situation. So what do you want your employees or your family or your friends or your boss or your government to do? Um, you know, um, it's, you, you need to adapt it to whatever feeds your, uh, your students. You can also use uh, newspapers headlights for the week and discuss them, asking them, you know, what they want the people involved in it to do about this topic, about this issue. Um, there is so much going on now with COVID, with lockdowns, with vaccines. You know, you have a notion of brilliant material to use. But having said all that, uh, still, some students find speaking activities very difficult simply because they don't know what to say. And really, I've had quite a few students who have told me, I'm sorry, you know, I, I know, you know, it's everything very interesting, but I don't know what to say. I can't think of what to say. And that is not, you know, it's, it's not um, uh, an isolated case. There are quite a few students who they, they really can't think of what to say. So you can provide them with um, some speaking tricks. You know, you can provide these struggling <laughs> students with some speaking tricks. For instance, you ask them to think of an action and then ask them to add all this information to that action. So you have to say, you know, the action that you're thinking and then with whom you did it, where you did it, when you did it, how is it or was it, why did, it, did you like it, and add but something. When they have managed to say all that, they realize that they have spoken for more than they thought they would. So ask them to do that every time they need to speak until they get confident and more relaxed about doing it. And it just becomes kind of second nature, adding lots of information to, you know, whatever they, they, they want to say. But finally, don't make a big deal about mistakes. Play mistakes down them to your advantage. Don't give, don't give them too much importance when they happen, because most students feel really horrible when they make a mistake and embarrassed, and they won't want to speak again if they are constantly corrected. So don't correct everything. Only things that really obstruct communication. Wait until the, and, and another thing is wait until the student finishes. So if you interrupt the student every time that he's speaking, he would just you know lose the stress and then shut up. <laughs> and, and they were so uh, wait until they finish. But you know people, I I don't have a great memory, so I forget things. So what do I what I do is just I make notes as the student is speaking. But the thing is. Don't make, don't look at your nose while, while you're doing them. Just look at the student because otherwise the student thinks that you are writing a report or he's doing something wrong. And you know, he's, oh my God, what was she writing? So just, you know, try to look at the student and just make quick notes like, you know, uh, tense or set a star, you know, anything that works for your, uh, you know, a mistake for your language. Um, at the end of, of the lesson, you know, whoops. Uh, you might want to go over the mistakes in general, all the mistakes they make, which normally have to do with agreement or tenses, you know, it depends on the language, but it's a general thing. So say, this is a great opportunity to remind us all about this topic or this grammar bit or whatever you're looking at, which we need to revise. But don't point at someone in particular, it's not your mistake or your mistake or your mistake, you know, especially if it's a big group. It's just, you know, a mistake that we all make that we need to kind of revise. 
with some shy or students uh, who find certain grammar topic difficult, try to assure them that the problem is not them. The problem is that the, the topic is difficult. You know, it's not, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> I always try to go, oh no, it's, you know, it's not cante, it's cantaba, because you are describing it in the past, or it's a repeated action in the past, or whatever it is. And they go, I know, I know, you know, we're all weird like that. We have two past tenses for which you have one. So this is particularly difficult for English speakers. And, you know, let me assure you, you're not alone on this. You know, I have thousands of students and they all make the same mistakes. And I get so much hate sometimes about these sort of things, especially, you know, ser and estar in Spanish and the imperfect and the preterite. They, they just, <laughs> some students just go, why? Why? Why do you have two past tenses? Why do you do this? <laughs> I find the outrage quite funny, to be honest. Um, but what I do is I always blame someone else. So I blame the first speakers of the language who randomly decided to go for one structure instead of another. And I always joke and say, yeah, it's just centuries and centuries ago when they were all thinking, OK, how can we make English students' life miserable in the future? Ooh, let's create the subjunctive or let's make everything masculine or feminine, or whatever we're working, working on that they find difficult. So that reassures them <laughs> that they are not alone, that there are thousands of students who struggle with the same bits. Because you need to give your students confidence. Because, why? In the end, we all want our students to thrive, and we all want our students to enjoy the process of learning a language, and the great achievement it is to learn a different language and to be proficient in it. And for that, they need to speak. So, thank you very much for listening. I am so sorry we have four minutes for questions, but I think we can extend the thing for a bit. And, um, oops. Uh, this is um, this is my email and uh, website details if you want to get in touch. Hopefully, I will. Can I go back there? Yes. So, thank you much. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I need to get some water. I'm so sorry for speaking so fast. Um, Emily, what do you need? Some time alone. What's going on? You know, normally, you, um, normally teachers have a bit of a, you know, uh, uh, like a. Um, psychologist, I don't know. Um, so you need what's you know what's the origin of the child behavior or why they would you know not uh, and, and work in, in your terms so sometimes the, the best I mean the first thing I would do is just to the student and see what you know what happens uh, I teach ill and we have different interests across the board do you have a catering to all different interests while engaging everybody oh thank you Manitin. Um, that that's it. So you need to kind of take turns with what I do. If if, if my students have many different uh, um, many different uh, interests, what I do is I go like with two or three at a time. So you know, go turns. But, but um, need to cater for all yeah all different interests actually, um, and try to make them. For instance, if you are doing, if you are, uh, if some of your students are in grass or uh, you know, some of them are interested in said Aussie gold hunter. Oh God, I watch that. And it's just <laughs> but you know, you can, you know, maybe some other are interested in um, in uh, machinery. You can talk about the machinery in, in the program. Some others, you know, um, handsome men. If you have people, you know, or, or describe descriptions of uh, of uh, Australia, you know. Uh, places, what you can do. So um, you can kind of adapt your topic to whatever you're doing. If you're talking about office, then you are in Australia. So what would you do in Australia? Some people, some people like, you know, uh, staying. Some people like, you know, uh, just walking. Some people like climbing mountains. You know, it's just trying to kind of get one topic that will address as many of your students' uh, interests as possible. Um, how does the online affect your students' willingness to speak? Uh, how do you manage students speaking over each other, which often happens when teaching online? Oh, I am very, um, 
uh, with that, no, that I, I don't think teaching online affects uh, their willingness to speak. They have to speak. I mean, uh, I just go, you know, you, uh, now you, come on, speak, you know, uh, whatever the names, Eliza, come on, what, what's your, you know, what did you do? What did you do last weekend? And you, you need to show a little bit and to make it a little bit easier. Um, so, for instance, I say, you know, what did you do at the weekend? And I know because they are all in lockdown. So they can't do anything really with their friends. So I say, I went to the theater and I went to a concert and, and this and that. And they were like, what? I'm like, no, I'm just kidding. You know, that's what I would do. So with lockdown situations, we use the, the conditional quite a lot. You know, I what would you do if you weren't in lockdown? Um, but yeah, speaking over each other with, um, when, yeah, no, just, you know, I, I just ask students. I said, you know, you raise your hand. If you want to speak, raise your hand, raise your hand. So. That, that, that's some um, kind of what I would do. Can you send your slides, please? Uh, I have all the slides and uh, a recording of the talk um, on the website, I think, because the, the, they are recording the talk. So you should have everything done. But if you don't, uh, you have my email and I can send you the thing. Uh, as a teacher, what advice would you give to your younger to be a better teacher? Oh, um, well, yeah, I would say, you know, have more fun. <laughs> and relax and smile more and don't pretend you're Mourinho <laughs> and you know everything because I felt you know this is this all that I've said it comes from my experience um, you know a very humble place um, what that has happened to me you know never um, I, I used to I used to think that I needed to have all the answers because what if a student asked me you know how you say this in English or well I, I, I was teaching classics as well so what if I know where, where this verb comes from? And uh, I felt really horrible. So it was quite um, a daunting thing to go teaching and just kind of praying, oh, please, please, please don't, don't ask me something I don't know. But in the end, I learned, you know, if you say, you know what, I don't know, uh, it's fine. <laughs> and, and they probably feel better if, if you say, oh, OK, well, the teacher doesn't know that. OK, so I always, oh, they always, uh, that's another thing I forgot to say in the talk, uh, thank them for teaching me something. So I said, you know, oh, thank you. I learned something today. You know, you learn something every day. And, and they feel really good when they can teach you something that you didn't know. Uh, for your time, oh, thank you. Uh, do you have any tips for persuading students to talk when in online classes? Um, well, same things. Just, you, you need to, you need to, it's like, <laughs> you need to be the honey to the, to the flies. <laughs> So you need to make bring something that will make them speak. So find something, you know, the news, get, get you know, Instagram or something that will show you what they are talking all about, because they are always talking about something. And if you talk about the thing that they are very interested in, like this Sistine thing that they are all going on now. So this week, my lessons are going to start with that. So, you know, in Spanish, but, um, you know, have you done the 16 personalities thing? What do you think? Oh, I, I, I got a protagonist. You know, what does that mean? And so, so it's a, you know, try to see what, what things they are interested in at that time to use that to talk. With adults, you know, they can't not talk about um, the U.S. election or what was going on with COVID now, the vaccine, you know, what would happen with businesses. So just use something that they will actually be attracted to. And any tips for a student teacher who want to create more authentic, engaging activities and admit when things are a bit difficult in a language? It has been told of previously for <laughs> doing these things by a mentor teacher. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, you can, uh, what would I, sorry, any tips for a student who wants to create more authentic, engaging activities and admit when things, oh, you know, I don't, well, you have been that these things are not to be done by a mentor teacher, but you need to do what works for you. You know, it's as I, you know, as I said, you you are the actor. It's, it's your body in there, and your, your mentor teacher is not there with you when you are doing these things. And the thing is, you need your students to speak, and you want your students to speak. I don't, you know, that that's the other thing. I try to follow the curriculum and everything, but you you don't really you don't need to follow the curriculum like you know, word by word, if you want them to learn something. So if I want them to learn the imperative or the subjunctive, I don't need to do it with the things that the textbook says I have to talk about. You know, if I want them to learn about masculine and feminine, I don't have to do it with the things that I have in the book. So for masculines and feminines, for instance, well, I teach at, uh, at a school, um, girls' uh, school. 
So I just bring, you know, um, bring up actors or, uh, you know, uh, very, very uh, handsome actors. And we were talking about, we were discussing the other day uh, who was the handsomest of all uh, the Avengers. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just for me, it's Thor, but, uh, you know, they go for the younger ones. Um, so, you know, just whatever you feel comfortable with and do whatever will make your students speak. Um, and yeah, it's just, you know, follow your, your heart. Uh, any suggestions about getting students to speak when learning remotely uh, as you don't see their faces if they don't open their cameras? Ah, um, well, that I, I haven't, no, I, I never done the thing without uh, seeing their faces. We always have this online so I can see who is, who is looking and who is not looking. Um, I will have a think about that, yeah. Um, and I will, uh, yeah. I have a thing. Sorry, I don't know that. Um, what should do with fear of speaking? What should we do with fear of speaking? Well, that's the thing. You need to relax. I have I have um, quite a few autistic students, and um, and you need to find something that they like. You, you need to find something that they are interested about, and uh, and just relax, you know, and don't be frightening. And that's why um, I always use um, smiling or or <laughs> follow your heart. <laughs> Uh, um, sorry, that's one of the comments in the chat. Um, I always, uh, you know, always uh, use humor. I try to use humor because humor relaxes people, and uh, and they, you know, they, they 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 lose a bit of fear. If you look threatening, they they won't speak. You know, if if it's um, uh, you know, with my uh, so I have one student who is um, autistic, and he he loves football. So I hate football, <laughs> but I had to learn about lots of uh, teams and, you know, who's the best footballer and who makes the most goals. And, you know, uh, he's a supporter of uh, Tottenham Spurs. So, yeah, I've been you know, trying to have a look at that and bring some pictures of that. So it's just trying to get, you know, to what your students uh, want, really. Um, can you share the presentation in the chat? Uh, Oh, uh, about the yeah the the chat I think as I said is is recorded and the PowerPoint is inside the chat so I think it will be on the um, uh, language show website and you can download it probably. Uh, that's brilliant. So relax and have fun. In England, some end of year speaking exams have been scraped for 16 years because for COVID. Yeah, how can I keep my students motivated in speaking classes without the incentive of don't talk about exams? Just uh, that's that's it. You know, at the end of um, when we were doing uh, what was it? Um, March. Yeah, March and April. They 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 just they said okay, we are not going to have uh, you know speaking exams. So they were like, what what do we want to do speaking for? And uh, we just started talking about, you know, movies. And uh, as I said, you know, <laughs> I keep going on Avengers. I love Avengers. <laughs> I, I love comics and I, I love, um, I, I am very childish. So it's probably why I get on so well with teenagers. But um, but yeah, we, we started talking about, you know, um, okay, so who is better? So if you were Adele, who would you marry? Or if you were, you know, if, if, um, if you had to choose somebody uh, for president of the United States, you know, uh, who, who wasn't, you know, who was an actor or a singer, who would you choose and why? Or things that had nothing to do with just with, with the with exams, just keep them speaking about other things. What did you do at the weekend? What are your plans for the holidays? You know, uh, who would, you know, what, what, what would be the ideal boyfriend? You know, what are the characteristics of the boyfriend you would like to have? Or, you know, anything, or what would, how many, you know, how, what countries would you like to visit and why? Uh, anything, anything that will, you know, uh, just, that's, that's the thing, talk, talk to them. I, I always to them and they to me because I, <laughs> I don't know, it's, it sounds stupid, but, you know, talk to them. I, I re I'm really interested, in, you know, what did you do at the weekend? And they go, uh, some of them just, you know, learn the thing by heart and go, uh, el fin de semana fue, I'm just like, no, no, no. What did you do at the weekend? No, oh, nothing. Nothing really. What did you do? Just stay at home, you know? Yeah, I stayed at home. I'm like, oh, bummer. Yes. Uh, what do you, you know? Did you watch a movie? Yeah. Oh, what movie did you watch? Oh, I watched this one. Oh, and you know, I'm watching that one. So it's just, it's just having a conversation, just trying to be. Here. <laughs> uh, I speak. I can make fun of myself and correct them. So it's like telling them to relax, make mistakes, and have fun. Yeah, no, it's not that I don't care, but 
thank you, Valencia. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, I will have to leave now because uh, we are like 10 minutes past the, the time. But um, thank you very much, everybody, for, for coming. I can't see you and I can't hear you. I can't chat uh, in there. But, but in, try to use uh, that's, that's, uh, try to try to help. So if you have something for yourself as well, uh, yeah, use it. So, um, <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Uh, but anyways, thank you, friends. Yeah, and uh, yes, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, hope it'll be helpful. You know, I just try to. Uh, um, good luck, everybody, and good luck, everybody who is teaching online as well. But yeah. Uh, have you know? Keep safe, and um, we'll see you in the end of this whole thing. So, thank you very much. Gracias, gracias, and um, uh, see you soon. <laughs> Adiós. <laughs>